Cross has 10. All right. Good morning, Crossroads. Good morning. Quick announcement before we get started with worship this morning. If you are involved in nursery or children's church on Sunday mornings, I have the first schedule for the new year in the back. See me after service. Also, if you're interested at all in leading a small class on Tuesday nights for or a small group on Tuesday nights for our Tuesday night kids program. See me as well. We've got a couple grades that still need a leader that will be there consistently. So see me after service. Thanks. Well, I'm definitely not the person that's usually up here, but we'll do what's best with what we got today. Um, I'd like to pray for us before we get started. So. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this beautiful day, and please help to prepare our hearts and just open them so we can be ready to receive you and worship the way you deserve and the way you'd like to be worshipped. And thank you so much for everybody that came this morning, and please help us to have a really fun time. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'd invite y'all to stand with me and sing a new song. A little bit. Ooh, I've been stacking up the years I spent trading punches with the enemy Ooh, I built myself a double pink stone Tower lies higher than the eye can see Trapped in this flesh and bone now to you, Lord, I'm desperate. Love, come out of this cage and set me free. All of my fears, like the Jericho walls, gotta come down, come down. All of my fears, like the Jericho walls, gotta come down, come down. Oh Lord, my prison turns to ruin when your love moves in. All of my fears, like the Jericho walls, gotta come. Pride and the blame cutting straight to the heart of me. Ooh, long before I ever called your name, you were fighting for my victory. Carved in your flesh and bone, the wounds that have set my soul is forgiven. Oh, now I can feel the darkness trembling. All of my fears, like the Jericho walls, gotta come down, come down. All of my fears, like the Jericho.
Love is true, your love is real
That's all right. They'll work it out. Thank you very much. Good morning, church. Happy New Year to you. I hope you got more sleep than we did. Uh, children, you guys, if you're here kicking around, you guys are dismissed uh, to Children's Church. We are going to be talking about starting off the new year right. Uh, and I've got a neighbor named Wild Mike. Actually, I don't know that guy's name. I know his name is Mike, though, because the cops kept saying it over their intercom. Uh, Mike apparently started off the new year rough uh, because he went to jail this morning. But it totally fits in with what we're getting ready to discuss. Because there's a group of guys that decided to start their day off a specific way in Scripture where we left off in the book of Acts as we're continuing in our series of what the new church was doing so we know what we should be doing. And these guys decided that they were going to start off by going to the temple at the hour of prayer. Their names are Peter and John. We discussed them a few weeks ago and they were stopped by a man who had been unable to walk from birth. It's 40 years now. Peter and John come up and he asks, do you have any money? Because that was his routine, right? They keep carrying him to the gate called Beautiful at the temple so he could beg for alms. Peter says, take a look at us, man. We've got nothing but what I do have, you can have. I don't have the money, but I have what you actually need. In the name of Jesus, walk, get up. And the guy does. Without hesitation, Peter grabs him, pulls him to his feet, and he starts walking, praising leaping about and clinging to Peter and John for the miracle he just received in the name of Jesus. And what do they do? They don't stop to celebrate outside. They go right to work. They go inside where they were headed in the first place to declare the message of who Jesus is. Our new year together can be a chance to start over with a clean slate. And maybe not Mike. Wild Mike, he's busy. But you can. You're freer than I think you know. Different intentions, honorable actions, humble thinking. We get to choose every single day how we start. Which if you haven't figured out in your life yet, that typically, that typically directs where you end. And we're going to discuss that in a minute too. But you get a choice every single day whether or not you let God take control or if you keep it for yourself. We get to choose rather to please God or to please ourselves. To make him happy, to aim at holy, or to aim at us and making ourselves happy. We can ignore God. Don't fool yourself. We do it all the time. God lets us do it. In fact, the majority of the people on the planet do this on a daily basis. We ignore God when we make a decision that pleases us, not him. We ignore God when we actively choose to sin, knowing full well as the Holy Spirit is screaming at us to do it anyway. We ignore God when we don't speak his things and instead focus our day around our own timetable or intentions. We even get to choose how we respond when somebody else is at work in God's life, when you can watch what's happening. We get to choose. Is it them? Is it God? Is it his doing? Do we glorify him? Do we take the credit? Do we ignore what's happening in the lives of those around us? Or do we actually engage and submit ourselves to it? The book of Acts is all about God sending his children to the ends of the earth to speak about his salvation. This is all the book of Acts. Every square inch of the miracles from the message that they produce and send out comes from God by, for, through him, and that's the entire book. 
And so these guys are doing exactly what they're told to do. They're starting to spread the message. They're speaking the things of God. They're performing miracles in his name. They're warning those who don't believe. For us as a church, we're going to focus our entire year this year on speaking the gospel message. Where we are, in our families, between each other, praising it, practicing it, sending it out intentionally, we should expect as a church a couple of things in 2023. You should expect some frequent potluck meals after service. I'd love to do one every single month. And ladies, don't have a meltdown. You ain't got to be the ones to do it. A man can cook too. Fellas, you can get to work. You can even buy something if you can't cook. We should, as a church, make it a habit of spending time in fellowship over a meal together. And don't tell me you don't do it because you either go out to eat or you cook at your house anyway. It's not a burden. You're going to swallow some food by the end of the day. I guarantee it. It's going to happen before 2 o'clock or you'll be mad at me. And at that potluck, every month, we should pray and take the Lord's Supper together. As the early church was doing, every time in remembrance of him, that we spend an intentional time with each other, not in such a hurry to separate once we've come together. And let's be realistic. Sometimes that's the key for church, right? We make sure to speak verbally against everybody who doesn't come here to celebrate, but we can't wait to separate back out because we got plans. We got stuff to do. I got things that I intend to do. And listen, I'm in the same boat. I feel the same way, but I promise God doesn't care if you've got a crockpot at home or a game to watch it for. He wants you, all of you. And he wants you together. Because grace and prayer, compassion, equipping, and then evangelizing and missions happen as a result. We should expect weekly outreach opportunities. We should expect frequent prayer gatherings over specific needs when somebody voices one. Let's get together in this room and just say, hey, I'm free at 8 o'clock tonight. Let's come in and let's pray. We should expect to send both local and foreign missionaries out commissioned by us because we see what God's doing in their life and supported by us to the ends of the earth, starting with our own community first. We've been given the word as a foundation We have loving Christians in the building. Now we need to continue in that work. Notice I didn't say start. We're doing it. We just need to continue in it. We need to run a little bit harder and a little bit faster. Let's pray together and let's get into our text this morning. Father, thank you so much for a new year. Albeit it did not start the way I expected. But that really doesn't matter in terms of my own life or my own actions and my relationship with you. Father, you get all of it. You get all of us, everything we have, everything we are. It's by your design and by your intent. Help us return it to you. Don't let us ignore you. Speak so loud that we can't. Get rid of the things that get in the way and put us to work because anything we do for you has got to be good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, open that thing up. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 through 22. Uh, and I promised uh, Aaron that I would change the inflection of my voice and scream a little bit at you guys this morning so she doesn't fall asleep. Anybody else in that same boat? Who stayed up? Who stayed up? Ah, uh, yeah, i got some night owls in here. I am just going to holler at you. Here we go. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read through until verse 22, and we're going to discuss some things that we see in here. But here's what I want you to hear beforehand, and I'm going to repeat it to you after this. Faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word. So whenever somebody is reading the word, whether you're in a Sunday school, whether it's up here, whether you're having a conversation with each other, whether it's a text message, whenever you hear the word... 
Its design is to build faith. It does not return void. And so as I read this, listen, and I'm curious what you hear. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men became to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, who were all or who all were of high priestly descent. When they had been placed in the center, they began to inquire, by what power and what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified... Whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He's the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given amongst men which, by which we must be saved. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, "'What shall we do to these men?' For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so it will not spread any further among the people. Let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Wow, that is so much fun. I can't wait to get in there. The question stands, though, what did you hear? I want you to really take some time and think through, especially whenever somebody is reading Scripture or speaking to you about it. What do you hear? Not what do you hear from the commentator or the commentary. What do you hear from Scripture itself? I'm going to do my best to stick with this this morning. Because this design is for you to be stronger in faith than when you walked in this morning. Let's continue in this. First thing I heard, Peter and John have true conviction. True conviction. It seems hard to come by these days where you find somebody who's willing to stand up and give an account for Jesus in absolute tyrannous chaos and still have the same level of conviction. Peter and John roasted them. The things that they said to their face in council, and listen, the council that they're together with, they are the guys in charge of everything. If the spiritual guys in charge in their culture called you a blasphemer, that's death. You can forget family, you can forget marriage, you can forget future, money, selling goods, coming to the temple, having your sins forgiven. No, you just got a sentence directly to hell if that's what they declare of you. And in their culture, that's what they would believe. Especially Annas the high priest or Caiaphas, his son-in-law. 
or John and Alexander, also family in their priestly order, waiting to come up behind the older men. This family is sitting there, judging what these men say. Now, here's an interesting thing. If you've ever been on the fence on whether or not Jesus is God and the resurrection is real, true conviction put all of these apostles in martyrdom. That means they were murdered for speaking that Jesus is God and the only way to receive forgiveness for sin. They're murdered for this. Who in their right mind, after having seen their king or their God or their prophet or their rabbi or whatever it is they thought about him, tortured and murdered would go around town still speaking the same message to the same guys that just murdered him if they didn't also see him alive. The resurrection is so proved in their conviction to me because you'd have to be clinically insane to keep spreading a false message knowing only thing that's awaiting you is death and nothing else. If you did not see Jesus resurrected from the dead and commissioned to go and do the same work and still have the same power being filled by the Holy Spirit to speak the message and to perform miracles, you would have to be completely off your rocker. It doesn't make any sense. Unless there's true conviction. Peter and John are so convinced Jesus is alive that they go and say things to the rulers and the elders and the scribes that are all gathered together for their trial. And the guys that put them over there, they're the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection from the dead at all. And so their major hang-up is that a heresy of a new doctrine, or at least a continued doctrine, because half of the Sanhedrin, do you understand these terms? Let me break this down first. Sanhedrin is a religious council that has two main schools of thought. One school belongs to the Pharisees, the other ones belong to the Sadducees. When they come together, they make up the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees arrest Peter and John because they're saying that the man is healed because of the power of the resurrected Christ. And so they throw him in jail. And when they're sitting together at this council with both schools of thought in session, the high priest residing over it, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can't help but wonder what the look on John's face was. Because Peter starts blabbing about everything that happened. And it doesn't say the same thing about John being filled with the Holy Spirit, even though I'm sure he was. But like in my head, I'm thinking, all right, Peter's blabbing again. And John's like, this is spicy. You're going to get us murdered. Listen to what he says, though. So that there's no mistake. He says, if we're on trial today, because of healing a sick man? Oh, you need to understand it wasn't us. It was Jesus. You remember that guy, right? Because it hasn't been very long. What are we at? Maybe the 50th or 60th day since the time you murdered him? Yeah, you remember that. The trial, the shuffling him around at night, the crucifying him, the one we keep telling you God raised from the dead, that guy? Yeah, he's the one. It's in his name that this man stands before you whole. He is the stone which was rejected by you. They are throwing centuries of prophecy in their face. Saying, you guys completely missed it. Did you not hear the prophets when they were teaching your fathers and passing down the scrolls of the law and the prophets to you? The ones whom you still read. You're the builders and you rejected him who is the chief cornerstone. He's saying, do you not understand your entire system of Judaism rests on Christ's resurrection? And you missed it. Instead, you murdered him and then missed the resurrection, that's the guy. And so that they're abundantly clear, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven. 
that has been given amongst men by which we must be saved. True conviction, true conviction is fun to watch, but you also look a little crazy. You guys ever known somebody like that? Somebody who believes that Jesus is who he is so much that they don't look like a normal churchgoer? Did you just say that? Yeah, I sure did. I sure did. And I'm not just talking about somebody you're standing outside with a sandwich board cut out, standing on the side saying, repent, hell's coming, and waving at traffic. That's not the type of crazy I'm talking about. I'm talking about the type of conviction that moves a person to action for Christ every day, regardless of what everyone else is doing, regardless of whatever life pattern everyone else thinks they should be following. They stand out. And you say, well, that's not very fair to me. I don't feel like I stand out. If you don't believe that you, that you don't stand out from the crowd for Jesus, can I encourage you to take a wild step into something new? Anything new. Because it may be that you are exactly where God wants you to be for whatever is coming next. And there's always something coming next because there's always another person who needs to hear the gospel and their life is always different than yours. There's always something next. I'm not suggesting for a second that if you're the type of person that sits at home and faithfully prays for everybody that you don't stand out for Jesus because you do. I'm just suggesting that if in your own convictions you do not believe that you stick out at all for Jesus, something needs to change if you belong to him. You need to stand out for Jesus. Your convictions cannot be hidden no more than a light or a city on a hill. Your convictions drive action. They drive decisions. They were willing to die for a resurrected Christ that they had seen murdered and then resurrected. Even though what they're saying is Jesus is God. He is forgiveness for your sin. And they should have been murdered right there according to Judaism they should have been stoned to death drug outside the temple thrown into some rocks and had them thrown at them until they were dead and then left there that's what should have happened if the religious leaders were following their religion to the law to the letter imagine being told by God on earth to follow me all you have to do is tell the truth and when you do, they're going to kill you for it. Would you still belong to them? Would you still follow them? Here's another thing that I heard in this section. Conviction drives personal choice. There's no way these guys were going to go back to what they were doing. There's no way that their life wasn't going to be changed. There's no way after seeing a resurrected Christ that they weren't going to get busy with the gospel and speaking the good news. Their entire world was dead different and there's nothing else they could do but follow there's nothing else they could do but obey they saw something that shouldn't have been possible but with God all things are possible so they run after it they intentionally set out to speak about Jesus I'm gonna take you backwards in Acts just a little bit to Acts chapter 2 and I want to read verse 14 Acts chapter 2 verse 14 says, But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. Peter can't help himself. He has got to say something. He's got to talk about Jesus. Uh, let me bring you to Acts chapter 2 verse 22 through 24. It says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed uh, through him in your midst just as you yourself know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again 
putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. He cannot help but speak about the things of Jesus. His convictions are driving his personal decision. Let me read to you another one. I got a few more that I want you to hear. Because all of these things are happening, overlapping each other. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Acts chapter 3, verse 16, Peter doesn't stop. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is in the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him his perfect health in the presence of you all. And then where he's standing now, in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, It's an interesting thing. Do you think for a second that if their personal convictions had not driven their personal decisions, that they would still be in the same position to be used by the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is no. Clearly not, because they're the only two standing in the temple right now being questioned about what they're speaking about in Jesus' name. The other guys, they may be speaking somewhere else. They might not. We're not told, but what I am told is the convictions of Peter and John bring them to the temple to speak about Jesus, and because their personal decision to obey and follow in those convictions and faith in Christ leads them to a perfect place to be used by the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't what they planned. They were planning to go up. They were planning to be there with the people and to speak about Jesus. Instead, they got a man that needed to be healed. That man drew a crowd for them, and the Holy Spirit did all of the work through them because they were willing to be used. If you wish to be used this year, are you going to have to be flexible? Whatever it is you got planned, no. I got a ton of them. I got a ton of things that I would like to do, personal and uh, professionally. I don't know what to call this. <laughs> As a pastor, I don't know. But if you're not flexible, I don't think you're going to see the Holy Spirit at work in you. Not the way you could. Not the way you should. And I'm not suggesting for a second that the Holy Spirit isn't in you, sealing you for the day of redemption. There is a difference, though, between belonging to God and being filled with the Holy Spirit. These things happen when you're in a position to be used fully for his glory and for your good, but it comes through your flexibility and determination to take action according to your convictions. I believe every person in this room has the same convictions. We believe Jesus has died for our sins and has been resurrected from the dead unless you've never made that decision for you. But if you have... I can also guarantee, I fully believe, not everyone's actions in that conviction is the same. And you say, well, Chris, of course they're not. There are different parts of the body. Yeah, but there's, there's a different pace to which each of those parts walk. Each of us has a different function, but we're supposed to be walking at the same pace. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. If not, I'll be in my office, not tomorrow, but on Tuesday. What are your convictions driving you towards, church? That's a good question for this year. Is it a bigger house? Is it more rest? Maybe your convictions are waning and it's driving you towards extramarital relationships. Cool, can you say that? Yes, because it's the truth. Maybe your convictions are driving you towards some non-biblical coping mechanisms like addictions. Maybe your convictions are driving you towards more self-care and more time for you. Can I suggest whatever's influencing those convictions needs to be cut from your life? You're the wrong influence or the wrong influencer. Here's something else that I heard too. Your decisions, they determine your impact. Whatever you choose to do, and listen, 
I wish this wasn't the case, but Scripture makes it pretty clear. We can have the conviction of who Jesus is and what needs to be done and then completely shut down the Holy Spirit in us. Did you know that you can do that? Say, if you haven't, and if that sounds foreign or like some sort of heresy to you, have you done anything wrong since you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior? If you have, go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, it should be everybody. If not, you're lying. You just did something wrong. Or sleeping. That's two. It's an interesting thing that God allows for his creation or his children to know the truth, to believe in it, to build faith up in it, and then whenever we find it convenient, to turn it off. And don't mishear me. I'm not saying you turn off salvation. I'm not saying you're turning off belonging to Jesus. Uh, but you can sure choose to do what's wrong. I know you can. I know I can. I know you have. I know I have. Your decisions determine your impact. Notice I did not say your convictions. Because unfortunately, if we're being honest, church, our average day does not get guided by our convictions. In fact, our decision-making process weighs what we believe against what we want. And we choose what we want versus what we believe. There's an interesting section in Acts chapter 4 where there's a discussion happening by a council of religious leaders. And again, you've got, you've got Annas, the high priest. You've got Caiaphas, who is sharing this responsibility in an odd, awkward manner for Israel's history uh, as his son-in-law. And you've got John and Alexander there. And you've got a lot of other religious leaders present with some elders of Israel. There is so much influence in the room. And they're discussing what to do with these uneducated, untrained men. And it says they start to confer with one another in verse 15. What shall we do with these men is the saying in verse 16. Because they can't deny for the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. That means either God is at work through them or God sent them as a prophet, and now they need to decide what to do or what to call the men who they've just arrested publicly in a place that was gathering the attention of thousands. Now what do we do? We don't like what they're doing. We don't like what they're saying. We want to put a stop to it because it doesn't match where we're headed. But there's this problem. God is clearly at work through them. A miracle has been done that we cannot deny. Decision time. What do you do with the information of seeing God at work and not knowing what to do with it? Because it doesn't match what you want. Church, that is a great inflective question to ask ourselves every time God is at work and we clearly know it, but it doesn't match what we want. And listen, this isn't just a, y'all better get ready, I'm going to do stuff to you next year. That's not that kind of a, of a, a question. This is a personal, everyday decision-making question. When you see God giving an opportunity or directing you to do something, and it's not what you want. Anybody ever been there? Show of hands? Like every day. <laughs> Could you imagine if this group of men answered their condemning accusations from Peter through the Holy Spirit with humility and repentance? Hearing the truth, being unable to deny it, they do not repent. They don't seek for more information. They don't ask them to continue. 
they don't rip their garments and put ash on their head for killing God in flesh. Because repentance is scary, right? It means I can't be what I used to be. No, not really. That's the thought, though, right? Like, if I repent, does it remove faith? Does it remove leadership, influence, holiness? No, it actually builds all of those things up. Repentance does the exact opposite of what the human heart tells you it does because it's deceitfully wicked above all things. Our nature is sinful from birth because we're under the blood of Adam and under the curse. And so you get lied to and told repentance would be a negative thing. That it somehow damages you and the way other people look at you. Here's what I think about that. If somebody looks down at you because now they know what you've been up to because you've repented over it, they can leave the building and never come back. Ooh, can you say that as a pastor? Yes, until they're ready to repent. And then they're gratefully welcomed back. Church discipline is a crazy thing, by the way. Its design is to drive humility and repentance. Peter and John are enacting the very first round and making a public accusation about a spiritual leader, about spiritual leaders about their entire system, saying now is the time. And if those men had repented and had followed after Jesus, they would have lost nothing and gained everything. They could have quickened the shift from Judaism to salvation in Christ and gotten rid of all of the turmoil for the next 40 years for the men that are doing this work. There should have been a culture shift. But instead of helping God's people step into the knowledge of who Jesus is, they took the veil that was torn in two and quickly threw it over the eyes of everybody that was watching limiting the access to who Jesus was by arresting the men who are speaking the message about what people just watched them do in the name of Jesus if they had humbly submitted to the truth of what had happened and repented they too would have been saved and then Peter and John and the rest of the apostles would have been giving sermons in the temple about the goodness of God and about his Christ But instead, one of their own is going to receive a letter real soon to be able to kill Christians so that that message might get stopped. Their conviction-based decisions took them to a place that was different than the conviction-based decisions of the apostles. I feel like you definitely need to hear that. Just because you you believe something does not mean you're right. That's a piece of my own medicine, by the way, if you're wondering. Just because I believe something does not mean I'm right. Just because you believe something does not mean you're right. From a conviction standpoint in Acts chapter 4, both ends of that scale are deeply rooted in their belief. We believe what we are doing is right. Clearly, both of them cannot be. Clearly, one of them is not. But it doesn't stop both sides from believing that they are. And it doesn't stop both sides from taking that conviction, putting it into a decision, and then driving an impact. So as much as you need to make an impact for Jesus... Please make sure in the new year when we step forward in faith, in ministry, in process, in programs, in prayer, that our decisions are actually honoring God. And they are driven by the Holy Spirit's leading because if not, our convictions are useless. And they're damaging. 
that needs to be something in the forefront of every believer's mind that my convictions actually match what scripture says and the Holy Spirit is leading my actions because if not, our convictions are awful. Here's another cool piece that I want you to see before I close us out. One of the coolest parts of scripture for me is found in this section. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, you've got, again, picture the whole scene. A man's healed. He's leaping and dancing and hugging all over John and Peter as they come into Solomon's porch. They draw a crowd. They're teaching about Jesus. The guys get arrested. They're set in the middle of the council. The council has no idea what to do with them. And here's the reason why in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John. That's the first part. Confidence is good. If your convictions are spirit-led, and clearly he was, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. (sighs) How I long for that. I have a ton of student loan debt. Because our world does not want uneducated and untrained men. If I had it to do over again, I'd have scrapped through it without getting a degree. You're hearing me say that out loud, right? Okay. So if we have other staff that don't have a degree, careful. The Holy Spirit is far more capable of delivering you a good message than I ever will be. And I've got the degree. In fact, I do my best not to deliver you the message. I get in the way all the time. Talking about cheeseburgers and wild mike. I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. That's just me. Listen to what they say, though. They're confident, uneducated, untrained, and all of the Confident, educated, and trained men were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Oh, I want that. I want that for me. I want that for my children. I want that for all of you. That there's no way that anybody who knows you in your life wouldn't be able to say that you have been with Jesus and yes, I know he's dead. Yes, I know he's been resurrected and brought back to life. Yes, I know he's ascended to the right hand of the Father and I know he is here because he promised to be. You have been with Jesus this morning because we're gathered in his name. My prayer for you is that it doesn't matter who you're talking about or who you, no, no, strike that. Don't talk about people. My hope for you is that no matter who you are talking with about Jesus, that there's no mistake you've spent time with him. It couldn't possibly be argued. Not just, oh, aren't these the guys that were in Capernaum? Aren't these the guys that were with Jesus here before? Like, aren't these the guys? No, I'm not talking about a facial recognition they're recognizing the fact that there's no way they would be willing to say or do these things if they haven't been with Jesus. It's unmistakable. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. That is beautiful. That's the follow-up, right? There's no way you could do these things if you hadn't been with Jesus. We don't want to give Jesus credit, but we're totally giving Jesus credit because y'all shouldn't be talking like this. You shouldn't even be here. You shouldn't be allowed in the temple right now, and yet here you are having this meeting, and you've clearly been with Jesus, so they're acknowledging who he is and what he does in people. And the follow-up? But Peter and John answered and said to them, as leading for our church and in your life, This should almost be your banner that is waved all over the place, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God. You be the judge. I would not like to be the judge, thank you. If you believe it is right to do 
in the sight of God. You will have your own time before the judge. You go and do you. I want you to do it. But if somebody is telling you, oh, you shouldn't be doing that, and you're doing that for Jesus, uh, nope, I'm not listening to that. You can judge for yourself whether you think I should be doing something for Jesus or doing what you tell me to do, but I promise it's going to be doing something for Jesus, not what you want. It should be the same for you. My household is run this way. My marriage is run this way. My children are run this way. The church is going to be run this way. That should be an amen. Don't say it. I'm hoping that is an amen in your life, in your own personal convictions, that you would rather do what pleases God than what pleases others, no matter who is telling you to do what. It doesn't matter if a parent is telling you to do something that God has told you not to do or, or telling you not to do something that God is telling you to do, you had better run at it. It doesn't matter if a member of the church is telling you, oh, you really shouldn't do that. If God has told you to do it, you better run at it. But take warning. If God is leading you, it cannot fail. You better run at that thing. But if it's you leading you, oh, you should expect some real real failure and I'm not just talking about friction because all of these guys got killed for Jesus let me read this out to you one last time in verse 12 and there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven that has been given amongst men by which we must be saved If you didn't know anything else about Jesus, know that today, keep that today, learn it, live it, love it, like get it done. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given amongst men by which we must be saved. It is only Jesus. Conviction, what do you truly believe? Decision, daily Choices made by you alone impact the way you affect other people around you. Those are the things we should focus on as we step into the new year because your impact can affect the decisions of other people and eventually alter their convictions and make them useless for the cause of Christ. I would not like to be the judge responsible for that. I would much rather everyone who knows us our members the people who are visiting anybody who engages in any of our programs knowing full well we have been with Jesus and there's nothing we can say in reply I would rather somebody say oh man that cat is so deep over hill or overboard for Jesus I'm not even going to bother talking to him about what I believe but I'm sure going to go talk to them I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have another worship song. We're going to pray. We're going to praise. Starting the new year off together right is so important. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, I can't wait to see what God is going to do with us because he's already doing things. There's so much opportunity for local missions here, especially since Corner's attached to us. So much opportunity to reach families uh, across the world. Um, We'll see what happens with it. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for being good. Not just like good, you've done something nice. Thank you for being holy. Because it's something we cannot do. Thank you for being what I cannot be, which is holy. Thank you for giving me the righteousness of Christ. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to follow, to direct us, to guide our paths, to lead us into every good work that you've planned. Oh, and I know you have them planned because we're still here. And until you return, Lord, let us walk in them. Let us go in the direction that you have in mind for each individual heart in the room. Because when we do that and we're unified and we're together, then your work abounds. It grows. 
And we see strength in our members. We see wisdom in our leadership. We speak the message and grow in numbers with new believers. Father, help us to that end, that we would grow with new believers because it is to your glory that that would happen. Father, we want people to worship you out of choice, out of conviction, not out of force. We want to see them worship you here so that they can be with you in heaven. Father, we pray that for everyone in the room. If there is somebody in the room that has not repented of their sin, that has not trusted in you as salvation, as payment for their wrongdoing, somebody has not trusted in the fact that you loved us enough to pay a penalty that you did not create. Father, I pray that today would be the day for their salvation. In the name of Jesus, I pray that. Amen. stand up.